Okay, we're white. Let's play. Let's play e4 this time. I feel like I feel like going e4. And okay, so he plays an alakine, which I kind of like because we haven't gotten a chance to face the alakine, I think. And in the alakine, there's two main moves against knight f6. You can play knight c3. You can play knight c3. Um, but that is not an ambitious move, of course, because black can play e5 and transpose into a Vienna, or black can play d5 and transpose to a favorable Scandi. So, of course, e5 is e5 is, is really the move. Knight d5 and now d4, as I'm sure you guys know, and black generally plays d6 here. That's the main line. Okay, so this is the first uh, crossroads. This is the first crossroads. Uh, again, white has two principal lines here. There is knight f3 to support the pawn. And then there is the move c4 to expand in the center uh, and harass the knight. If you want to play uh, the most ambitious line, and if you want to strive for a big advantage, a line to play is the four pawns attack against the alakine. The four pawns attack is a very, very dangerous system. Now, I will say that I don't know it too well. So we're going to play it, but I don't know the theory all that well myself because I don't generally play it against uh, players my level. So c4, and now there's e takes d6, which is the, relatively speaking, more positional main line. But what we're going to play is something very explosive, f4, the four pawns attack against the alakine, considered to be one of the best lines, if not the best line, uh, from an objective standpoint. Uh, if white knows what to do, then white is definitely uh, better, although not by too much. Thank you, Jeremiah. So here, of course, we play... Not d takes c5, which allows an unfavorable queen trade. We take toward the center, fe. And it should be clear to you guys what the pluses and minuses of this system are. The plus of the system is that we get a monster center. The minus of the system is that we're delaying our development. And if we don't develop carefully, our center could get under very serious fire. We could end up losing all three of these pawns. And this is the first stage at which you simply have to know what to do. If you don't know what to do... You might play the move knight f3, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that's the main line. But it's not. Why is knight f3 not great, and how should we defend this pawn instead? Yeah, knight f3 allows bishop g4, which puts massive pressure on the knight and therefore uh, to the pawn. No, don't go d5, because that drops the e5 pawn. We should go bishop to e3. That is the only viable defensive approach. Yeah, d5 would drop the e5 pawn. Knight f3 allows bishop g4, so we must play bishop to e3. Generally, if I remember correctly, yeah, bishop f5 is the main line. And now we can develop normally. Now we can first play knight c3, just developing the knight. And if he plays e6, which is the main line, we play knight to f3. And uh, so we successfully have defended our center. Uh, double jazzy, I'll talk about that after the game. Yeah, so knight f3. Now... Black can still play bishop g4. That is one of the main lines. Bishop g4 is such an explosive move that people sometimes waste the, waste the whole tempo and still go bishop g4. That's one of the lines uh, that Black has at his disposal. Another line is to play uh, bishop b7 and then prepare f6 to open up the center. That, I think, is the most popular continuation. Um, and we're, we're going to see what our opponent chooses here. Knight to b4 may seem a little bit scary, but... It's not dangerous due to rook c1. I think maybe some of you are thinking about knight b4, but you just have rook c1. So let's see which line he chooses. Bishop e7. Now, obviously, white, uh, we must complete our development. And uh, we have two squares for the bishop. We can play bishop d3, but bishop d3 weakens the pawn a little bit. It allows bishop g4. So we, we should develop a little bit more modestly here with bishop e2. So all of this is pretty natural. Now, usually black castles and then plays f6 in this line. Or f6 immediately to chip away at white's center. Castles, castles. Yeah, and here f6 is the main move. Okay. Let's see if he knows it. Now, f6 uh, opens up the center and activates black's dark squared bishop. On the other hand, the drawback of that move is that e the e6 pawn is going to end up being very, very weak. Uh once the the trade occurs so as far as i remember i analyzed this maybe like a year or so ago white is better white is better but 
it's a very complicated position, so it's not the kind of advantage where black doesn't have any fun. Eight five. Yeah, this move I'm not familiar with. I don't think it's a move. I, I mean, I think what he's trying to probably do is expand, uh, expand on the queen side, but I feel like this idea is too slow. In fact, I think we can already step on the gas pedal, so to speak. We have completed our development, so our center is now very nicely defended, and the move that stems from that observation is uh, is d5. We should consider it. Okay, so d5, e, d, c, d. And uh, that pawn is going to be defended twice and attacked twice, so he can't take it with his knight. So after d5, e, d, c, d, this knight is going to have to move because it's under fire. So he's probably going to go uh, knight to b4. And that knight from b4 is going to be let, uh, putting more pressure on the d5 pawn. But in that resulting position, can anybody tell me whether white has a nice way uh, to transform the position and defend the d5 pawn? I think there's a very nice approach there. Knight d4 is interesting, yes, but that's not what I'm thinking of. What I'm thinking of, not a3, a3, he's able to take the pawn. So I know it's hard to visualize. Let's make these moves on the board. Let's make these moves on the board. Bishop c4 would drop the bishop. Uh, due to the b6 knight, which is still on the board. Hopefully he goes ed and knight b4, so I could show my thinking process. Now, the moment he played a5, one observation that I made immediately is that the knight on b6 has lost a little bit of support. It's still defended by the c-pawn, but it's no longer defended by two pawns. And so I immediately kind of noticed the pattern that in some positions, bishop takes knight might force him to take away from the center, and that could shift the balance away from the center and give this d pawn a path forward so you guys should already be able you guys should begin to think about the correct approach after knight before we play bishop b6 cb and then d6 the bishop is almost trapped there not quite trapped but that pawn is going to be a total monster and i think he's kind of realizing that here so I, i'm quite familiar with this type of idea so it was easier for me to spot but now you're going to be familiar with it as well. Could you play d5 before trading on... B well, that's what we're doing. Oh, could you play d6 before trading on... No, because if you play d6 first, then he will simply take the pawn, and then the queen is going to be defending the knight. Yeah, yeah, no, I understood your question, but the answer is no. Okay, so... The movie plays is knight's b4 immediately. That doesn't change anything. That doesn't change anything at all. I mean, he keeps uh, he keeps a pair of pawns on the board, but still, we play bishop takes b6 and then d6. If anything, I think his move is probably a little bit better because the bishop on f5 is now anchored by the pawn. But still, white is white is basically dominating. It's funny how like the the uh, the videos where I played a cheater are the most viewed of the speedrun. I don't know what that really says. But I guess people like the the intrigue and the drama. Maybe I should just title all of my speedrun videos, like, playing a cheater. I wish that weren't the case, but it is. Okay, so he goes ED, he panics, and that, yeah, he shouldn't have done that. I think he's still pretty much okay if he responds correctly. But this is a classic situation. He just saw D6 and he panicked. Uh, so he plays e takes d5 and of course we could play c takes d5 and recapture but why do that when we could simply drop the bishop back and we're up a piece okay he can play dc but then we play bishop c4 there's no compensation so where should we put this bishop what seems to be the safest square for the bishop where it's out of the way of ideas like knight c2 what's the most solid square it's definitely f2 it's nicely protected uh, we don't need to worry about the f-file being closed. We're already up a piece. And, you know, that's like winning the lottery and saying, well, um, the $100 bills that I'm being handed are a little bit too crumpled. Like, you're already up a piece. Don't worry about preserving all of the advantages of the position. And that's a mistake that I see pretty often. So a move like bishop e3 could be justified by the logic of trying to keep the f-file open. But, of course, it would succumb to the move knight c2, immediately forking the rook and the bishop. Knight d4 is unnecessarily tactical, I think. And in fact, I think it would be a blunder because if we had gone knight d4 to counterattack the bishop and he simply drops the bishop back, that bishop on b6 uh, is going to be trapped because the knight is going to be blocking its way back. So we should just keep things very solid here. 
This should have two. If I have calculated it correctly, I'm not sure. Always retreat. All right. So already the game is basically over. Uh, not only is he down a piece, but look at how well coordinated all of our pieces are. They're nicely positioned in the center. Mad on b4 is not dangerous. We could always kick it away. Go c6. So speaking of kicking it away, let me ask you guys a question. Is a3 knight c2 dangerous for white? Should we perhaps go rook c1 first or knight d4 first? Or is it okay to allow that? The knight is trapped. Yeah, it's totally fine to allow knight c2 because we play rook c1 and then we can simply take on c2. Yeah, now of course we can play cd and knight takes d5. I anticipate he might resign. So we can play knight d5. We could also play queen takes d5, centralizing the queen and offering a queen trade. I actually quite like queen takes d5. I feel like it, it also connects the rooks, which is nice. And perhaps this knight could sink its teeth onto b5 later. Let's take with the queen. Let's keep things very open and simple. It doesn't matter. Knight d5 would have been perfectly fine too. As I always say, don't overthink these kinds of uh, low-level decisions. It's not worth spending more than 10, 15 seconds on them because even if there is a marginal difference, uh, it, it's just not worth the extra time if you're playing a rapid game. Yeah, so we're now a full piece up. There's, there isn't even any pawns. How should we proceed in a position like this? What seems to be the most clinical pathway uh, to converting this? So I propose activating, excellent. Everybody getting getting the answer right, centralizing the rooks. Let's put this rook on c1. Let's put the other rook on d1, both rooks on open files. And he is totally paralyzed completely. I mean, not a single piece can, can ascend. He's, he's probably gonna go bishop e6 or like bishop e4, but then we could still go rook fd1. Yeah, bishop e4. We could still go rook fd1, defending the knight. We don't need to move the knight. He is welcome to trade. Who was the first guy to realize you should put the rooks on the open file? Well, everybody realized it. Okay, rook e8. Okay, so um, there is technically a threat of uh, my opponent taking on f3 and then taking on e5, but that's not a scary threat. That's just a pawn. I wouldn't worry too much about protecting every remaining pawn. Go instead for the, you know, see the bigger picture in, in such a position. So there's a couple of approaches here. Um, we could take the knight and then go like knight c7 and trade everything. But I particularly like the concept of sticking the bishop on, on b5 uh, and, and attacking the rook. So one of many, many good moves. Uh, bishop takes f3 is the one move that needed to be calculated. Because if bishop takes f3, there we go. Which of the two pieces should we take? Should we take the rook here? Or should we take back on f3? Both are obviously winning. We're not talking about like one move being winning, one not, not winning. Okay, so some of you guys fell for it. If you take the bishop, then that very same rook, which is being attacked, can take on e5. But if you calculate concretely, if you take the rook, and then they take the bishop, and we take the bishop with our rook, we're still up a piece. Our pieces are still coordinated, uh, and we are able to preserve the pawn on e5. So I think what may dissuade people from going for this is like the bishop on e8 may seem a little bit awkward. And yeah, he attacks the bishop. But don't, remember the concept that you shouldn't be scared of threats just because they're a threat. Threats are not scary because they're threats. Threats are scary if you can't stop them or if they achieve something. So just because a piece is on a slightly vulnerable square doesn't mean you should automatically reject a line. If you calculate concretely and you see that there's no way to actually win that piece, you can safely go for the line. So bishop d7, why bishop d7? To prevent him from going rook c8, to keep the rook confined. Uh, and the bishop is just like a thorn in black side. Now we can play very nicely to finish the game. How should white proceed? Of course, there are better options than meekly trading the knights. One proposal is to begin with the move bishop c5 check, activating the bishop and then to stick the knight on this weak square on b6, continuing to twist the knife in. And if rook b8, we can make a really cute move, and black is gonna be completely paralyzed after that move. We can immobilize the knight with bishop to d6. So this is really nice. This is a kind of a, an easy conversion. It's very easy to make good moves in a position like this, but still, 
Okay, rook a6, how should we win the game here? Here there is a crushing move on the spot. Noticing that the rook x-rays the bishop. If we take the bishop, it's a back ranker. Discovery with this bishop, where should we go? Bishop b5 is very easy. Um, attacking the rook. Okay, he's got to move the bishop. Okay, resigns. Yeah. Nice game. So, openings like the Alakine are very risky precisely for this reason. Particularly at a level where white is likely to know what to do. Um, they're potentially high risk and high reward openings. If you know the Alakine very, very well, you can win a lot of games in it. You can get good positions. But if you forget a single line or you don't study it too well, you could end up suffering and being miserable and struggling basically every game because objectively speaking, black's position is quite dubious. And so in order to compensate for that, you got to know the theory very well. Adept 888, for the prime. So my advice would be if you're willing to invest a lot of time into learning your black openings, an opening such as the Alakine could be something to consider if you're 18, 1900. Um, but you got to be okay with playing cramped positions where your opponent is a big center. Some people kind of like that. I kind of like that. So I have played the Alakai in my share of times. It is a very sharp opening for the most part, but some lines can be very positional, just like the Sicilian. Is the Sicilian a sharp opening? It depends which line. Uh, some Sicilians can be very positional. Uh, most Sicilians, yes, are, are, are definitely on the tactical side. So d4, d6. There is a plethora of good lines to play against the Alakai. Um, knight f3 is considered was considered for a long time to be sort of the cool line i think recently no but it's still good i mean knight f3 definitely gives an edge d5 95 one of the craziest lines in the alakine uh continues knight to d7 this is an old move trying to trade the knights me does anybody know what incredible tactical option exists for white here this doesn't win this is a theoretical line it leads to an incredibly messy position Yeah, so knight takes f7, king f7, and queen h5 check, forking the king and the queen, king and the knight. But the king steps into e6, defending the knight, and you get into a completely chaotic, just total pandemonium on the board as white tries to hunt the king around the entire board. This is a very entertaining line, so you can dig around yourself. Um, you can look this up. Um, knight d7 is not particularly common. This doesn't occur too often anymore. I don't know what the current theoretical evaluation is. I think it might be a draw c4 uh so there is a force strike but white can play queen g4 and repeat moves like this um but if if uh, i think the main move here is c4 yes yeah, c4 knight f6 d5 king d6 and you get this position boom 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 the queen slides into f7 threatening to go to e6 and the line goes on it's totally crazy you can investigate this yourself this is a little outside the scope of the speed run. Um, so that's one move. And the other set of lines is either c4, e takes d6. And here black has both c takes d6 and e takes d6. Uh, c d6 is the more tactical line. It, it, it creates a pawn structure imbalance because obviously it gives white a majority on the queen side, gives black a central majority. e takes d6 is more tame, keeps the pawn structure balance, expedites the development of the bishop. But it's also a little bit more passive. Um, you know, this is pretty easy to invest. I'm sure there are YouTube videos you could find that, that uh, give you an overview. Um, but we decided to go for the principle of f4. So d5, fe5, knight c6, bishop e3. That's the main line. Again, if knight f3, bishop g4, and now you play bishop e3, I think this is possible. I don't think this, I don't think this loses. Uh, but black is a very nasty move here. You can just take the knight. I think that's the move. Let me check. No, no, e6 first. e6 first. And it's just that this additional burden is very hard to handle. Uh, because at any point, black could take the knight and basically force you to take with a pawn, ruining your structure. It's just that, um, it's just that white center gets under a lot of pressure. This is unnecessary. You can play bishop e3 first. This move has no downsides. And what you're basically doing is playing a cat and mouse game, which consists of the following. Black has to develop the bishop sooner or later, right? You can't delay this forever. If you play e6 and try to develop the other bishop, 
well then you block the bishop in the first place and uh you cannot procrastinate with development you can't afford to do that when white has such a center and so only after bishop f5 do you play knight f3 uh that's a common technique in many openings where you want to avoid an unpleasant scenario is you just simply develop your other pieces first and the moment your opponent makes a move then uh you do whatever you wanted to do and in order to create that unpleasant scenario they have to lose a tempo i don't know if i just made sense uh but that's the bottom line bishop b7 bishop b2 castles castles and a5 i think is a big mistake um as i said the main line is f6 e takes f6 bishop f6 and you get this very interesting position white generally goes if i remember correctly queen to d2 then rook a to d1 just securing the d4 pawn black does the same thing queen e7 you know rook d1 rook d8 white is better uh, white is slightly better nice nice center uh very good piece coordination but black has you know black has his share of 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 active play and and there are people who know these positions very very well for black um but if anybody has any questions this this is a pretty easy to understand position there's nothing crazy that's going on here so anyways f6 is the move but a5 is is too slow this doesn't address white's monster center and moreover the moment that this move is played i pay attention to this knight on b6 this knight on b6 is now a little bit more loose and as it turns out the c7 pawn plays a very important role of acting as a foil to the d pawn and so that's why we play the move d5 d5 knight b4 bishop b6 and of course c takes b6 whoops not this move but cb6 keeps black in the game d6 and he can put the bishop on g5 um i think the best sequence for white is definitely to take this bishop and after queen takes g5 to play a very important move who can spot this is a good positional question for you guys this is not a tactic not a tactic it's a positional move and it's a and it's a good positional move who can uh who has a guess about what to do? Okay, so I'm I'm seeing nobody said the move so far. Nobody said the move so far. Okay, so let me give you guys a hint. Yes, Master Troll God got it. It's the move is Queen C1, and I just verified this with the engine, so I'm not making this up. Um, now let me explain why. First thing you have to do in this position is identify the threat. And when you're identifying the threat, and a piece of advice I gave earlier is not to rush, not to rush this process. Um, it's not often, it's not always as easy to identify the threat as it appears. In addition, there might be more than one threat. That's the case here. There's more than one threat. The first threat is queen e3 check, forking the king in this very important e5 pawn. So you could try to defend against that by, let's say, dropping the king to h1. But there is a second threat. I'm noticing that the queen and rook are in a forkable position. This knight on b4 is also quite dangerous, as we've discussed. So he's got the move knight c2, rook c1, and the knight swings around to e3. This is a devastating fork, because not only are we forking the rook and the queen... But also checkmate is threatened. White loses the queen. So what you want to do is find a move that both defends against knight c2 and defends against queen e3. So we must take this square under control. That's why queen c1 accomplishes all of these things. Obviously defends e3. And in the event of a queen trade, the value of a pass pawn increases in the end game, as you guys know intuitively, particularly the value of a, of a uh, protected passer. If black tries to go knight c6, uh and win the pawn then what we can do here is we can counter attack the b6 pawn we can go knight a4 and in a very funny sequence we get another protected pass pawn but this time the c5 pawn is a lot more robust white is just winning here the pawns are overwhelming so queen c1 i think is a very nice move um remember that you can kind of weaponize the queen trade sometimes queen trades don't mean you want to get into a boring end game sometimes the queen trade is the only vehicle uh to keep your advantage um rook f3 some people suggested i think that's probably a good move but what i'd be worried about here is something like bishop g6 now this e5 pawn is incredibly weak so 
In addition, I'm not sure you've addressed the question of knight c2 and knight e3. Um, well, yeah, you're right, VP. So, you mean after knight c2, queen, queen c1? Yeah, that's true. Queen c1 probably does defend uh, against the immediate threats. Something I didn't notice at first, but still, I mean, I can move my queen away and the knight is protected. So, but you're right. No, queen c1 is a, is a very important resource. Uh, so I would just add that this bishop g6 idea is another reason why you want to eliminate black's queen because of the pressure on e5, and you could end up losing this pawn. So good by good catch about knight c2. So knight c2 might not be like a threat in the strictest sense, uh, but it's something that could happen to you if you like. If you play queen d4, then I go knight c2 and I win the exchange. So I hope this makes sense. Um, after ed bishop f2 the game is over there's really nothing to talk about here we just won the pawn traded queens and got our pieces into the game and and the rest was the rest was easy any questions about this game <laughs>